Yeah. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to this conference in parallel with the 50th Human Rights Council session. The topic we will discuss today is regarding the sensible human rights situation in Yemen. First of all, I would like to welcome to Welcome to this conference in parallel with the Human Rights Association. The topic we will discuss today is regarding the sensible human rights situation in Yemen. So, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this event for their invitation to participate. I am Christine Mir, Deputy Director of the Coordination des Associations et des Particuliers pour la Liberté de Conscience, or CAP Freedom of Conscience in English, a French secular European NGO with United Nations consultative status, created in 2000 and dedicated to protect the rights of freedom of religion and belief. We combat all forms of discrimination based on religion or belief, by alerting European and international bodies. The eminent experts here present that I will introduce to you will address several issues related to human rights violation in Yemen perpetrated by the Houthis. The purpose is to enlighten us and more important, to alert international bodies on the unbearable humanitarian disaster that has been taking place since 2014 in Yemen, and which made this country and its people one of the most damaged of the century. In 2018, already the United Nations warned that 13 million Yemeni civilians faced starvation that could become, I quote, the worst famine in the world in 100 years. And in 2021, the UN Secretariat's Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs estimates the death toll in the wake of the conflict at 377,000 with some dying in the fighting and other violence, some from malnutrition and or related disease. Our experts will focus today on the following aspect of this tragedy the issue of cross-border terrorism, the violation of freedom of religion, and the violations against women. To help us understand the issues of the Uti movement and the cross-border terrorism, I have the honor to introduce Dr. Hans Jacob Schindler, Senior Director of the Counter-Extremism Project, CEP, Dr. Schindler is the Senior Director of the Counter-Extremism Project in New York and Berlin, co-chair of the Advisory Board of the Global Diplomatic Forum in London, member of the Advisory Board of Justice for Kurds in New York, as well a member of the Board of Directors of Companion Skills International, CCSI, in New York and London, as well as a teaching fellow at the Academy for Security in the Economy, ASW Academy AG in Germany. In 2013, he joined the ISIL, Daesh, Al-Qaeda, and Taliban sanction monitoring team of the United Nations Security Council and served as the team's coordinator from 2015 to 2018. Between 2005 and 2011, he held the position of first Secretary of Political Affairs and Liaison to the Security Forces at the German Embassy in Tehran. From 2001 until 2005, he was part of the federal government of Germany's team investigating Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia. He holds a Master and PhD degree in international terrorism. So, Dr. Schindler, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much for this. Uh, if you bear with me for one second, so I can pull up my presentation. I hope you can see it now. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for the invitation this afternoon or this morning. I'm speaking from New York. And of course, thank you to the Coalition of Independent Women uh, for organizing this important event uh, today. As already been mentioned, uh, my name is Hans Jacob Schindler. I'm from the Counter Extremism Project. Before I start, just two sentences about who we are and what we do. Um, CP is a transatlantic, fully privately funded think tank and advocacy organization that works on a wide range of violent extremist ideologies from violent right-wing extremism all the way to Islamist terrorism. And of course, we're also working on the Houthi movement from this perspective. We have offices in New York and Berlin and representatives and representations in Washington DC, London, Brussels, Dublin, and a partner organization in Bratislava. Uh, we work primarily with governments in the US and in Europe, as well as on the level of the EU. And as I said, I'm speaking today from our main office in New York. My brief presentation um, will include six points that I wanted to make. First of all, we will start our best, I think, with a SWOT analysis. So what is the actual threat, the Houthi movements, what's the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats? Then I'll um, talk a little bit about their missile and drone capabilities, because this is what primarily is the most visible transnational threat of the Houthi movement at this point. Um, then the relationship to Iran, of course, is very important. Um, then I'll go to the threat to international shipping that the Houthi movement currently presents and what else it could do. Um, looking at smuggling and sanctions evasion, what countermeasures should really be undertaken by now. And I'll uh, conclude with a little bit of um, uh, a look at what risks persist, even if there would be some kind of political settlement um, in Yemen. Um, obviously, this is a very much hard-nosed terrorism analysis. Um, the agreement was that I start with a look from the outside and then the other speakers would go towards the more internal situation in Yemen. So let's look at a SWOT analysis, very classic economic tool to do this. So what are the strengths? Of course, the Houthi movements, even before 2015, had, as a movement, long fighting experience in prolonged domestic conflicts. As you all know, between 2004 and 2010, there were several uh, um, military operations by the then president of Yemen, uh, Saleh, against the Houthi movement. They have, of course, always had, but now since 2015, immensely increased external support from Iran and more recently also from Hezbollah. And they have for a long time already um, organized and very well functioning regional smuggling networks that even cannot be outmaneuvered by some of the measures that had regional member states or the United Nations Security Council had already undertaken. Its weaknesses, of course, is that the economic situation, as I'm sure we will hear multiple times today, is quite dire, dire. Luckily, this also means that the arms development of the Houthi movement is not progressing as fast as it potentially could be. Iran doesn't see the Houthis on the same level as other, in particular, Hezbollah proxy organizations that it has. So that means there's only uh, support from Iran to a certain extent. And we have already a sanctions regime in place, um, which is, of course, not bad, but could definitely be improved. Opportunities for the Houthi movement, of course, is its strategic location uh, in Yemen to disrupt international shipping, and I'll get to this. Um, the ability to target Saudi and now more recently UAE oil facilities and the lack of transparency in the regional financial system, which enables and underpins its smuggling operations. The threat that is, of course, uh, by, posed by the Houthi movement is that there is, at the moment, uh, currently a focus on the coalition members, in particular Saudi Arabia and the UAE, but you know this could widen. Uh, it is ideologically opposed to the US, the West in general, as well as Israel. So that already shows, shows you that there is a, a broader target environment that is definitely possible for, as far as the Houthi movement is concerned. And at this particular juncture, of course, any further energy disruptions in the global flow of energy um, um, through the Gulf uh, and, and through the uh, Red Sea is going to be far more impactful than it would have been a year ago, um, if you remember what happened uh, in Ukraine recently. Um, this is, of course, not claiming that these are all the major points that you should consider when looking at the Houthi movement as a threat, but it also previews 
um, a little bit, I mean, it's the main important points and it reviews a little bit what I'm gonna now address in individual points. So let me go through the uh, missile and drone capabilities. Now, this has been really the, the uh, subject of the intense debate, how much capabilities the Houthis have, how much they don't have, what the targeting precision of its capabilities is or not. Um, however, I think three points uh, can be said with confidence. First of all, the Houthi capabilities are increasing. And here you can see the various different um, uh, capabilities that it has. Um, it's actually pictures from a exhibition that Houthi movement did itself a couple of years ago. Um, so the capabilities are increasing slowly, but they are. They're getting longer ranges and they get more precise in their targeting. Secondly, the Houthi depends still on the delivery of spare parts from Iran. There is no internal capability to build everything, but um, the internal capability to assemble those spare parts um, is definitely already there and is more sophisticated than it was a couple of years ago. Therefore, it's no longer depending of, on Iran or external other actors shipping entire systems towards the Houthis. Spare parts are more than enough for it to use these systems. And finally, um, the Houthi movement has demonstrated over and over again um, that it is uh, willing to use its strike capabilities outside Yemen as a political tool. Um, the map that you can see here is uh, from 2019, so it doesn't even include the most recent attacks against the UAE, but it's just here to demonstrate how far the range of the Houthi capabilities is going already, if you look at the, the dots around the Arabian Peninsula. Um, in the past two years, there was really a broadening because for the first years, really any cross-border strike capability to any major extent was concentrated on Saudi Arabia. But um, now the UAE has come back into what the Houthis would consider uh, a legitimate target. I would call this cross-border terrorism. Here you can see the latest attack near Abu Dhabi airport. Um, the UAE targeted, uh, the uh, UAE was targeted despite its 2020 decision to essentially withdraw uh, itself from the conflict, at least as far as um, uh, ground troops are concerned. And the debate is that this strike in January this year near the Abu Dhabi airport, and then of course also against a US installation, here you can see the drones that they use. Um, the debate is that um, um, this was in reaction to some uh, territorial gains uh, of the Giants Brigade in Shabwap in uh, January. But I would like to point out that to attack a active civilian airport um, with a more than precise strike, uh, more less than precise strike, is taking a huge risk if the rocket had not landed uh, in the uh, commercial area of the airport, but at the actual active runway while a airplane was taking off, we would look at many, many civilian casualties. So the targeting of uh, even the vicinity of the airport shows the Houthis were at least theoretically willing to occur a lot of innocent civilian death. Um, the second aspect of the missile capabilities of the Houthis, which I think is very important, is especially in this situation where, as you all may have heard, the regional tensions are already ramping up again concerning the negotiations in Vienna about the return or not return to the JCPOA. Um, is the Houthis a capability uh, as far as missile and drone strikes are concerned can easily be used by Iran um, to cover up its own regional behavior. And the most uh, obvious example, of course, here is the attack on the oil facilities in Saudi Arabia in 2019. You can see the damage that was done at the time. Um, and here is the actual flight path. I would like to remember everyone that the Houthi movement actually officially took responsibility for the strike, but further intelligence analysis and flight path analysis of how these uh, um, facilities were struck um, clearly demonstrated that the Houthis did only play a minor role in this and the actual strikes came very, very clearly from Iran. So using these capabilities as a cover operation, especially now that we have a heating up recent situation is concerning. This brings me to the Houthi relationship with Iran. Um, the Houthis, as I already mentioned, are not yet a full proxy. There's really two phases of the engagement with Iran prior to 2015, where I would say Iran saw the Houthis as an afterthought. Some financial support, small amounts of weapon support in its 
uh, um, uh, fight against uh, President Saleh. After 2015, of course, this support um, increased considerably. They received now material support and training from Iran. They received support from Hezbollah. They, um, the Houthi movement declared itself as part of this Iranian axis of resistance against the West in the Gulf. Uh, here you can see in the picture the spokesman uh, Mohammed Abdul Salam, uh, Salam, who uh, in 2019 met the Supreme Leader. Now, meeting the Supreme Leader is not something that everyone gets the honor to do in, in inverted commas. This really indicated the value that Iran puts on this client relationship. Usually it's just simply head of states or maybe Hassan Nasrallah who gets to meet him so that the spokesperson of the Houthi gets to meet uh, Ayatollah Khamenei really clearly indicated that something had shifted. Um, what the Iran really skillfully did was to use the Houthi movement and uh, the conflict in Yemen since 2015 as a way to drain its regional adversaries resources, i.e. in particular, the Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, um, used the Houthis as cover for its operations against both states and um, uh, gained the capabilities therefore to attack oil installations in Saudi Arabia from both directions, both from Yemen as well as from the Iranian mainland, which means it really increases the capabilities of Iran to strike regions. Further threats, of course, uh, is that Iran is now using uh, the conflict in Yemen as a testing ground for its own weaponry. Um, and if the regional conflict um, continues to heat up, will the Houthis be willing to do Iran's bidding? I would say on balance at the moment, the answer is yes. Threat to international shipping. Um, we have seen in the last couple of years repeatedly that the Houthi movement both in harbor and at sea was trying to disrupt Saudi shipping and attack Saudi vessels. Um, the Houthi territory, if you can see here on the map, um, um, I hope uh, it's big enough that you can see the bluish area is Houthi held territory in Yemen. And this is very close to uh, the Bab al Mandeb, which means another choke point of international shipping, which the Houthi movement, either on its own or on the bidding of Iran, could easily disrupt. Uh, if you want to remember, um, what happened with the Ever Given in the Suez Canal in 2021, you can see what this effect would have on the, um, on the global supply chains. Um, and it now has uh, given Iran directly and indirectly to control both choke points in the region. So on the one hand, the Strait of Hormuz, which is already you know, under uh, IRGC control from the Iranian side, but also via the Houthis then, the Bab al-Mandeb, which, uh, um, uh, which increases its striking capabilities immensely. Um, in case you think this is a theoretical thing, these are all the incidents um, on international shipping um, just for uh, a couple of years. Um, and uh, this is not all Houthi related, this is also in large, large uh, uh, portions um, uh, piracy related, but that also means that any further disruptions in an already very insecure water lane means uh, reinsurance, shipping insurance, vessel certifications, all of these things are going to be more expensive and given already strained uh, supply lines, both through the pandemic as well as the Ukraine conflict, um, this is really a point of concern. Sanctions evasion is something, is a bit of a technical point, but I think this is quite important because we do have a regional financial system in the Gulf states, which is for the global financial system, extremely important, but uh, is already grappling with a lot of challenges. There is still a lot of Islamic state terror group money invested in the region which needs to be found. And the Taliban um, who have taken over Afghanistan, as you all know, last year, are funneling drug money in, in extraordinary amounts through this uh, uh, regional financial system. That needs to be checked. And of course, we have Iran sanctions evasions going on for already a couple of years. But now, as you may have heard, in March, Russia and Iran officially uh, assured each other that they are going to help each other's sanctions evasion, which will put another strain on the uh, regional financial system in the Gulf. Um, this is all uh, you know, coupled with the lack of transparency, especially in free trade zones, as well as the lack of beneficial ownership information in those free trade zones in the Gulf is going to be a big challenge. Therefore, um, the Houthi smuggling network is also an instrument that Iran can use to evade sanctions. Um, there is heightened money laundering and financial crime concerns. As you may have heard, the FATF 
put the UAE already for the first time ever on its gray list. Um, the um, financial system of the Houthi seems to be well established. Um, and we have already a you know, sanctions move by the US, but also by the UN, but it's not yet really a focus. Just to give you an idea, the United Nations Security Council, which does sanction the Houthi movement, only has nine individuals and one entity, and the entity is the Houthi movement itself. So no shell company of the Houthi movement, no facilitators of the Houthi movement, except this particular individual. All the others are one or two are non Houthi members and the others are military or political leaders. And my argument would be in order to really um, work on this problem, um, more of those actual financial facilitators should be on the UN, the US or even the EU list. Finally, even if there would be a um, political settlement of some kind inside Yemen and the Houthis focus on fighting the members of the coalition would vain to a certain extent, the problem would not be solved in our uh, counter-extremism project and mine assessment. Um, feeling themselves as the part of the axis of, EVA, uh, axis of resistance by the um, Iranians, as well as a identity as a revolutionary movement clearly opposed to the US, the West in general, and Israel, means the Houthis will need always conflict and an enemy in order to exist as an ideological movement, which means very clearly, um, if the situation in Yemen uh, calms down, there is a risk that the Houthi movement will look beyond the coalition at other targets. Um, or if the sanctions regime ramps up, um, this is the cost you would have to pay in order to uh, disrupt more effectively um, the financial and smuggling networks. Um, the Houthis may well target beyond the regional actors. Finally, um, just to summarize, we talked a little bit about the UAE and missile capabilities, the cross-border attacks against Saudi and the UAE, and why this is a problem. Also, that these capabilities are now uh, used or can be used and have been used as a cover for Iranian regional operations, very concerning, in particular in the current situation. We've talked about Iran, the patron client relationship that the Houthi feels themselves as part of the axis of resistance. Um, the movement has demonstrated that it is willing and capable to threat, uh, to, to be a threat to international shipping. It had already attacked Saudi vessels and has access to a strategic waterway. Um, the smuggling and sanctions evasion threatens the integrity of the regional financial system, which is a big concern. And finally, um, extremist ideology that the Houthis have and its identity as a revolutionary movement means it will continue to need an enemy and conflict, even if a political settlement in Yemen is found. Okay, this concludes my short presentation and I'm very much looking forward to your questions and our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schindler, for giving us a better understanding of the issue on the terrorist action perpetrated by the Houthis in Yemen and the consequences of the involvement of external forces and countries like Iran in the perpetration of these terrorist acts. Now, let me introduce Mr. Andy Vernot, volunteer for the International Alliance for the Defense of Rights and Freedoms, AEDL. He is also president of Post Versa, president of the World Council for Public Diplomacy and Community Dialogue, and volunteer board member of Friend of the Earth, located in Belgium, Flanders. Ms. Vermo, Mr. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Vermo dedicates his entire life with passion and total commitment to creating a better world where fundamental rights can become a reality for every human being. Today, he will describe the situation of the religious freedom in Yemen freedom which is seriously threatened by the discrimination and persecution by the Houthis of certain religious minorities. Mr. Vermo, please the comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation and privilege to be here to support the work of the National Coalition of Independent Women. And I want to thank especially Dr. Wissam Bastindoa, and Mr. Batin to have invited us here today. I'm really personally relieved to be back 
in a physical gathering here in Geneva on the edge of the United Human Rights Council. We are all glad to be here together in this very important location after the COVID time. There is nothing that beats being together to raise the lack of human rights issues in Yemen. Yes, where all universal fundamental rights for the people of Yemen. Where is the freedom of speech? Where is the freedom of worship? Where is the freedom of movement or the freedom of association and liberty itself? With the World Council for Public Diplomacy and Community Dialogue, a civil society organization consulted by the United Nations and the fundamental rights organization Postpersa, we publicly condemn the Houthi movement's religious persecution of Baha'is, Jews, and all Muslims who are not following the Houthi regime's religious view. When the Houthi state survived school, in 2014, respect for religious freedom declines. It is estimated that around 65% of the population is Sunni, while 34% is Zaydi Sia. We are not alone in our critique since we are monitoring the situation with the World Council for Public Diplomacy and Community Dialogue and of fundamental rights organization, Postpersa. A delegation of the United Nations specialists agreed last year that the witness thinks to be violence and discrimination against Baha'is, Jews, and other religious minorities. And this was also included in the United States comprehensive reports on religious freedom. When I read the report, it blew me away. It breaks my heart to see that the Houthis have no regard for religious freedom or freedom of conscience. They are the primary perpetrators of innumerable interferences to lawful detention and inhuman torture practices of the religious minorities, as well as Yemen's immense search and corruption. Last year, on June 10, the Houthis launched a missile and an explosive drone strike on a rock and a civilian compound in Map City launched by Ansar Allah. It breaks my heart to learn that 38 people were killed with from 30 civilians, inclusive women and children. Even three ambulances responding to the first attack were damaged by the following drone explosion and two ambulance staff were heavily injured. It breaks my heart to know that in 2021, the Houthis breaches of religious liberties have simply grown numerous. It also hurts me a lot to what further systematic and quiet elimination of the Baha'i religious community as well as the illegal detention and physical torture of Baha'is. I want to mention there is a lot of pressure for Baha'is to force their religion and ongoing illegal confinement, mostly without the rights to fair trial. In October 31, 
2021, the British launched again the missile strike of students in Karajuriba and Central and Mount Juba's region. It breaks my heart to consider that a ritualistic missile attack on a mosque and a religious school killed 29 civilians, including again innocent women and children. The Houthis have done everything in their power to limit the to limit the control of abuses of religious freedom, so that many offenses remain under the radar. Because government control of the former Yemeni government was not allowed. And it's incredible that they still dare to claim the Houthis that they would fight corruption. Despite the facts that the Houthis are the embodiments of everything that is corrupt in Yemen. As a result, we must continue to watch the Houthis religious persecution in Yemen, which is not a simple doubt. The Ruby dictatorship treats Ethiopian and Ethiopian religious economic migrants as entirely inferior in Yemen. And they are socially discriminated, such as in the delivery of emergency relief and in the critical health treatments. The Jewish people in Yemen are an indigenous, non-Islamic religious minority. And according to the polls, four to six Jews remained in the nation by the end of the year. It breaks my heart to learn that the last year the Houthis compelled three Jewish families to flee the country. The Houthis in Mars preach hate towards the Jewish population and even demand for the total annihilation of everything Jewish and school textbooks. It is sometimes overlooked and forgotten. However, that Yemen's severely diminished Jewish community belongs to the local people. In general, access to religious groups outside of this one of the Houthis is quite restricted, making it more difficult for all NGOs to reach the secluded community, since we can't discover anything on the states and mistreatments of the Ismailis at this time. According to British journalist Yona Greg, the regions are controlled by the Hitlers, by the Houthis, and then the repressive nature means that access to reliable information is very difficult, even once journalists get into the country. There is, in fact, a very big problem with the press freedom and freedom of information in the reading regions of the coup. But this is another discussion. But we can conclude that this is also a mind blowing on so many different levels. And a major issue for Yemen's human rights and religious freedom is that in addition to Iran's officially military, Iran has built institutions linked with their governments and certain authorities. These military institutions are formed in a manner that extends beyond the limits of the nation states. And they coordinate activities in accordance with the needs of the Iranian regime. These parallel organizations often comes before the country's recognized army. It breaks my heart to know that the Quds War, which is associated with Iran, is an example of this, since it's collaborates closely with the Houthi regime. This violating 
de la loi qui constitue de nos vivants sous une forme structure, la like plus forte, are supported by the Iranian government and are violating international law by developing the regime targeting civilians. These irregular institutions, looking to the regime, are constantly instigating social events, assaulting notable persons and organizing killings. The good force of this Iranian revolutionary guards has previously been consulted as an autonomous army in Iran against Iraq in 1988. It is a special operations unit utilized outside of Iran for combat intelligence reasons. And it is reported that the Quds force had 15,000 professionally trained men. All these linked with the Quds force have fought in the Soviet and Afghan wars, the Iraq-Iran conflicts, the 1982 Liberal War, the Bosnia and even Balochistan wars, and the Kamil battle against the PKK and Pijak, and now also the Syrian and Yemen wars. Ismail Khani has led the push forward since the killing of General Qasem Soleimani in Baghdad. According to US lawmakers and academics, the push force is one of the identities that controls many of Yemen's issues. Everyone has their own qualities. Each of us is born into a family and into a community. Each of us is born with a sense of rights and wrong, a natural sensitivity and a conscience. We all admire and respect bravery and heroism. The child is driven by an intrinsic desire to please his parents, while the parent is driven by an innate need to protect his child. Without a doubt, this is what we call human nature. What makes man human is universal, and it permits them all. It permits us all. We must all strive together to ensure that fundamental rights of freedom of expression, freedom of freedom, and respect for the international law of of one culture and one another. They are represented everywhere. The world attention now is on the way of the planet. But it brings to know that there are maybe an estimated 377,000 deaths in America since the beginning of this conflict. And there is a need among all the people for peace. But that peace can only come when the world is the people of the rookies to come to the negotiating table. The earth reaches its hands. We, the world comes to for public diplomacy and community dialogue, the fundamental rights movement, Pope for the international community to pay more attention to the again. 
Er hat ihn nicht. Arabia. Where are you? Rebellion is spirit. So I can fix them. And live in peace. That's his orbit today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vermont, for this accurate account of the continuous and increasing violations of the rights suffered by all Yemenis to all their own beliefs, stating the ruthlessness of the Houthis to impose their own religious doctrine. This is causing a large number of people to flee their country to avoid such persecution. Our last expert on human rights in Yemen is Madame Manel Salmis. She is a researcher in environmental humanities and American studies. She is a blogger on MENA issues as Europa blog. She collaborated as an expert on the climate change, on the Arab Spring, and on gender equality with the European Commission and European Parliament. She worked as a translator for Human Rights Watch and participated in many projects involving young people in the fight against extremism in Brussels by collaborating on educational projects with France to fight against radicalism and anti-Semitism. Madame Salmi is a project partner at UNESCO on environmental issues and the fight against climate change since 2019. She is also an advisor to parliamentarians at the European Parliament on MENA issues, gender equality, and the fight against radical Islam since February 2019. She is the president of the European Association for the Defense of Minorities. She is currently the president of Liberal Women's Section, Hotel City. Madame Salmi specialized in international relations at Service ULB Diplomatic School with extensive research on the Middle East and Iran since 2020. And finally, Madame Salmi received top human rights awards in 2018 and was appointed ambassador respect zone in Belgium for a fight against hate speech on internet at the level of education. She will explain the dramatic condition in which Yemeni women are trapped and the unacceptable violence they are suffering at the end of the Houthis. I invite now Madame Salmi to tell us what it means to be a Yemeni woman these days. Madame Salmi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, dear Christine. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the audience present here, outstanding and brilliant students. And I would like to thank my friend Andy, uh, Christine, for being here, as well as Bethan uh, Al Aksi, who is a human rights activist, uh, and Dr. Richard Basandawa, who is the head of uh, Yemeni Coalition for Independent Women, for organizing this amazing event and for having me here, as well as Dr. Chandler for his. Uh, uh, amazing speech and uh, uh, research and uh, really I'm really impressed by, by your research. Thank you so much. Uh, so as Christine introduced um, I mean my uh, paper, it will be entitled Women's Rights Violations in Yemen. Uh, women in Yemen are the most vulnerable population who not only lack their basic rights but also their individual freedoms. The Houthis are always targeted have always targeted women, mainly journalists, human rights activists, political figures, and influential female leaders such as top models. Free and independent women are the enemy of the extremist ideology of the Houthis, who want to subordinate them and indoctrinate them, especially young girls, in order to win the ideological war against free women and men in Yemen. Targeting women is a strategy used by the Iran-backed militia to silence their voices and deprive them from their rights to participate in the social, political, and economic life in the country, mainly after the Arab Revolution. There are so many examples of the Houthis' policy to discriminate against women and use systematic physical, psychological, economic, and verbal violence against women and girls. There are so many different forms of violence in Yemen, and I'm going to um, tackle a few forms of violence that the Houthis 
were using uh, against women and are still using again. First of all, traveling without mahram. And what is mahram in, in, uh, um, uh, in the religious concept is that the woman cannot travel without being accompanied by her husband or her father or her brother. So the Houthis have severely harassed women who travel without a mahram, expelled and prevented women from working, imposed gender segregation in some universities, required women to dress in a certain way, and endangered women by preventing them from having access to reproductive health care in certain areas under their responsibility. There are so many incidents targeting women or restricting women's rights Given the frequency with which the Houthis have attacked and harassed women, the total impunity of members involved, the extent of the restrictions imposed on women, and the fact that some of these restrictions are the result of the official policy of the Houthis, the responsibility lies in this extremist, with this extremist group, which targets women systematically. Segregation begins in universities and education, as well as threatening individual freedoms. On August 8, 2020, the president of Sana'a University, appointed by the Houthis, issued a resolution call for the separation of male and female students at the university's graduation ceremony. On Wednesday, September 30, 2020, the Houthis officials search for a sample graduation ceremony at a private Yemeni university, the armed men force the students to leave, claiming they are mixing, as a 20-year-old woman said. So this is an example, just like the Taliban, that's just like women in Afghanistan, separating men and women uh, from mixing into universities. The Houthis also sought to impose their view on how women should be dressed, attacking women's individual freedoms. At the end of 2020, the Houthis forced many public and private universities, including the Lebanese International University and the German University, to publish circulations and posters with rules on dress code for female students. It prohibits girls and women from wearing makeup at weddings and parties, wearing short clothes, tight abaya, and short head coverings. The Houthis recruited female employees at the wedding hall to see if they are wearing makeup. Only women wearing abaya and without makeup can attend the party. The case of Isa Hamadi, who is a top model and a beauty queen, is very telling. This beauty queen has been kidnapped and imprisoned by the Houthis for three years since she stands for freedom and Yemeni beauty, and she inspired a lot of girls and women. And women. women are prevented from work. It was pointed out that the expansion, expansion of women working in Sana'a by the Houthi had a big effect, and some employees did not like to hire women to avoid similar pro problems. A few months later, there are recorded cases in which the Houthis bans many women from working in the province of al Hudaydah. By preventing women from having access to work, the Houthis use economic violence against Yemeni women, leaving them vulnerable and completely dependent on men to survive. Another form of, of violence is targeting human rights activists and female leaders. A report has been implemented by the United Nations since the beginning of January, has last year and was finally finalized in December 5, 2021, submitted to the Security Council of International Organizations. The survey total, uh, totals 300 pages and includes nine surveys in which I quote, politically or professionally active women were imprisoned tortured, disabled, sexually abused, or oppressed, end of quote. This, through the survey, UN experts reveals patterns of abuse and arbitrary detention of female activists in Iranian-backed Houthi-controlled areas. 
these areas have always been severely devastated by the war and are affected by the radical ideology that rebels uh, uh, that the Houthis impose on their citizens. Last year, there was a big wave of arrests, torture, and sexual violence against imprisoned politically active women aiming at terrorizing these women, obliging them to stop, to stop their activities, which threaten their existence. Increasing oppression of women expressing political opinion is affecting their ability to participate in the dispute resolution decision-making processes. According to you, UN report, I quote, these measures have a calm effect on these female leaders. End of quote. The Houthi's policy of sexual violence and oppression of female politicians and experts operating in the national capital, Sana'a, and the modern part of the country has been used since the beginning in an attempt to silence the free voices who call for freedom, gender equality, democracy, and freedom of speech. I come into the conclusion, and I have a lot to say about this topic, especially in terms of silencing women and female leaders and activists. The women's rights violations in Yemen are a reminder that the radical ideology of the Houthis is incompatible with the values of democracy, freedom, gender equality, and justice that the West and countries yearning for liberty and independence church. Unfortunately, young women and girls in Yemen cannot have a decent life and a promising future with the Houthis in power. Women are denied their basic, basic rights and have no access to education, work, political and social life. The future of Yemeni women depends on young girls who are excluded from the decision-making spheres and who are prevented from participating in the country future and also prevented, prevented from participating into a balanced political and economic system. That is why the UN, EU and US, as well as leaders of the free world must empower Yemeni women and free them from the Houthis militia control in order to have a dignified life and to be able to participate in building the country together with their main country. Thank you. Thank you for standing up and revealing and exposing to all the atrocities suffered today by women in Yemen as consequences of the violent oppression for the Houthis that take the condition and rights of women back to the darkest ages of human history. It is urgent that the international authorities react and do everything possible to make Yemen a country of rights where everyone can leave their differences in peace. Before ending this conference, I would like to thank the panelists once again for their relevant presentations and their great personal involvement in the pursuit of solving this serious issue on human rights violation in Yemen. I would like to warmly thank Dr. Wissam Basindawa, head of the Yemeni Coalition of Independent Women, who made this conference possible to alert on this serious issue. And thank you all for your attention. <laughs>